Our youngest grandson is at a stage right now where he is fascinated with a ringing phone. Uh, he's been doing this as a five and now six year old, where, and, and it can kind of be cute when he, when he, when the phone rings, he runs to wherever the phone is and he comes running back to wherever you are, whoever's phone it is, and he, he with so much urgency, uh, he comes running with the ringing phone like it's on fire. <laughs> And he hands it to you and he's saying, someone's calling, someone's calling. Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> and until you find out it's just a telemarketer uh, and it's not so cute at that point. <laughs> uh, it's also not cute when, when I do the same thing as a grown adult. Uh, letting the phone just interrupt my day at all hours of the day. I finally got to the point where I usually just have the ringer off all the time. And when I have time, I'll check my messages and answer, answer calls or whatever. But it's easy, it's so easy to get distracted with so many things. Uh, everything needs to be, seems to be going faster and faster in our world today. It seems like one day is blurring into another. Our culture makes us think that if we really want to get ahead in life, we have to cram every minute full of activity but being busy doesn't mean that we're being productive with our time and energy or with our gifts and talents. Being busy doesn't equal success. And in the process, we end up often doing urgent things over important things. And we, so we have to learn to do the right things the right way. And this is how we move from a life of success to a life of significance. Uh, this is how we move from the temporal to the eternal. This is how we move from hopelessness to hopefulness. And so we're going to see today in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, that at the, that at the start of Jesus' ministry, he, uh, we've already seen as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, that he had become very popular at this point. His fame is starting to spread. And where we pick up the story here today, Jesus had already gone to the synagogue People were amazed at his, uh, the authority with which he taught uh, because he taught uh, unlike uh, the other um, teachers. And while he was there, a demon-possessed man had come. He had Jesus cast out the demon. And then he went to Peter and Andrew's house for a meal after synagogue. But Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And so Jesus went right to her bedside. He healed her from the fever. And that evening, news spread about, uh, about what Jesus had done. Uh, people from that town of Capernaum brought all of, their, all of the sick people to Peter's house. Jesus healed all of them. I'm sure everyone was rejoicing that night. The whole town was buzzing with excitement. They're also grateful for the miracles. And I'm sure the disciples were thinking that Jesus can do this again, you know, like rinse and repeat. Let's try this again tomorrow. This is a great thing. We can bring in more people from the village, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the outskirts, right, from the countryside. Um, and so, uh, but, but Jesus had other plans. And this is where we pick it up here in verse uh, 35 through 39 of Mark 1. It says, and rising uh, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now, we are seeing this story from Simon Peter's perspective. Um, what a surprise it must have been to realize that in the morning, Jesus was not there. <laughs> I mean, this was a great idea that Jesus had, right? Uh, wake up, ride the wave of momentum, strike while the iron is hot, all that. But instead, Jesus gets up and he, he goes away from the village away from the coming crowd, and he just disappears. I mean, he leaves. And we don't know exactly where he went, but we just know that it was a, it's described as a desolate place. And it was so desolate that the little phrase there in verse 36 says that they searched for him. Uh, that could be translated, uh, they hunted for him. Uh, maybe they got some hound dogs uh, to sniff him out. We don't know. Uh, maybe they went uh, formed a search party uh, because in verse 37 they told him, Everyone is looking for you. 
Everyone was eager to see Jesus again, but Jesus was not eager to meet them again. Uh, Jesus was not running for office. Uh, he's not trying to get votes. He's not trying to get on the cover of a magazine. Uh, Jesus needed strength. He needed fresh wisdom and, and direction. And that's why he pulled away to pray and spend time alone with his heavenly father. And this is, this is a pattern that you will see unfold in Jesus' ministry. The, the more hectic life became, the more he pulled away to meet with his father. Until the disciples finally found him, and, but Jesus did not return. Instead, he, uh, he went to the other villages and towns around Galilee. And the reason Jesus didn't go back uh, right then and there, he did eventually come back later on, but he didn't go back right then and there. Is, the reason he didn't is very simple. is because Jesus didn't come to save Capernaum. Jesus came to save the world. Uh, he wasn't building an earthly kingdom. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God has come. And this is a, a, a big lesson for all of us to learn. It's important that we figure out not only what we should do, but also what we should stop doing. Uh, success is not only knowing where we should go, but also knowing where we should not go. And not letting ourselves get distracted from the most important priorities in our lives. In Luke 10, there's a great example from the time that Jesus went to Martha's house for some home cooking. <laughs> Martha was busy getting dinner ready, and uh, her sister Mary was just sitting there, listening to Jesus uh, teach along with everyone else. And Martha was getting very frustrated because this, this was a very large group. Uh, if, if you've ever taken the Enneagram uh, test, the, there are other personality tests, but, but the Enneagram, this, I think this would be like a type two on there. The Myers-Briggs, the DISS, those, those have different names for this personality. But um, these types uh, for the Enneagram are called the givers. They, they're, they're very loving and caring. They walk into a room and they can sense who needs what to feel comfortable. And uh, my wife is like this. She's a, she's a two. And uh, they, they rarely say no when someone needs help. Um, they feel like, and, and they often feel like they can do anything uh, to help anybody. Um, so uh, th they have to kind of watch themselves or those around them have to watch them that they don't overextend themselves uh, with these things. And it seems like that's what Martha had done. She invited everybody to come over to her house and now she's feeling overwhelmed. And Jesus has 12 disciples. Uh, so with Jesus and the 12, that's 13 minimum. Um, more than likely her brother uh, Lazarus uh, was there as well. Uh, and of course, Mary's there, and then who knows who else came along uh, that uh, who who was there to see Jesus. Uh, so it was an incredible honor to have him in her house, and uh, but and and her sister Mary also knows what a great honor this is, and so much so that Mary doesn't even get up to help. Mary is just focused on learning from Jesus. She's hanging on his every word. And so that leaves Martha to do all the work by herself. This was not a co-living situation, by the way. Uh, it's not like the two sisters were splitting the rent. Uh, no, verse 38 says that this was, this was Martha's house. Uh, she's the one paying the bills. And she's the one who extended the invitation to Jesus. And Luke 10, 40 says, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, uh, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister <laughs> just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. That's a little bossy, I think. Right? <laughs> That's another thing. We won't go there with that. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. I hate to say this, but uh, I tend to side with Martha on this one. Uh, Martha is a woman of action, right? 
Mary, well, Mary, she's just sitting there. This isn't church, right? This isn't a quiet time. This is time to get up and help out. So the problem was not that Martha was doing the wrong thing. In fact, Martha was doing the right thing. She was serving Jesus. But Martha was doing, the problem was that Martha was doing the right thing the wrong way. Jesus tells her that she was distracted with many details. Everything had to be just right. The evening had to be perfect. All of those details were pulling her apart. I like the way the Amplified Version of the Bible uh, renders that verse. It says, the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. I wonder how many of us can relate to Martha today. I wonder how many of us are distracted, worried, bothered, and anxious about so many things. We all know what it's like to be distracted. You're here, but you're not really here. Preoccupied, inattentive, distant, absent, Martha was doing something that could be done later. I mean, if there was no food, Jesus could just make food, uh, right? Like he could multiply, we know he could multiply bread and fish or whatever ingredients she might have had, right? And then there would have been even leftovers. Uh, Everybody could have pitched in at the end to help clean. Uh, Cooking and cleaning can be done anytime. But Jesus visiting, that just doesn't happen every day. Uh, That's why Jesus tells Martha, Mary is doing the right thing. It's easy to fall into the trap of doing the right things the wrong way. If you, you might be on a date with your mate, but you let the dinging and the pinging of the phone interfere. You might be at work, but you're checking social media. You might be listening to this message and you're thinking about that text that just came in. (laughs) It's funny how how the person sending you a message or tagging you in a post can seem so important. And then when that person is actually with you, in front of you, you're not really there. The roots of our relationships have to be watered with attention. If if they aren't watered, they will get dry. Uh, They'll become fruitless. The way to nurture our relationships is by being all there when you're there. Be fully present where you are. Give them undivided, undistracted attention. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So we have to learn to be focused. We have to learn to be present so that when that person leaves, they walk away feeling like they were important to you. Uh, They don't feel like they were a burden to you. Uh, And this is also the formula for deepening deepening our relationship with God. Uh, We give him our attention. Uh, We read God's word and let it soak into our souls. We pray to God, our Father. We give him our, our devotion as our first priority in life. And, but that doesn't happen by accident. It takes focus. It takes resolve uh, to not get distracted with meaningless things, even good things. Um, there, there's a great example in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings 19. Elijah was, the prophet was at Mount Sinai. And he was in a cave hiding from the evil queen Jezebel. She wanted to kill him. And Elijah is scared. Uh, He was feeling like he was all alone. And the Lord met Elijah there. And God told Elijah to go to the entrance of the cave that he was in. And as Elijah stood there on the side of the mountain, at the entrance of the cave, it says that as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Hmm. And this is finally when God spoke to Elijah in the whisper. All, all of this was an object lesson for Elijah the prophet. Elijah was confused. He was at a low point in his life. He was bewildered. He was perplexed. He was feeling sorry for himself. He was in so much despair. He had, he had been having thoughts uh, that he wanted to die. This is the same Elijah who challenged 450 prophets of Baal. And he challenged 400 prophets of Asherah at Mount Carmel. And this is the same Elijah that God helped to supernaturally somehow outrun a chariot of horses. And it had, this is the same Elijah who the, rain, the heavens stopped for three years. And after three years, God told him to pray and the drought was over and the rain came down. Elijah could have been out tearing down altars and false gods. He could have been out fighting for the cause of God. He could have been raising, raising someone's son from the dead. Or he could have been calling fire down from heaven to consume the enemy. But instead, God brought him all this way to a cave on the side of a mountain to do nothing. No people, no audience, no kings and queens. And it was there that God finally spoke to him directly. Not in a mighty wind, not when the earth shook, not from the heat of a fire. No, God spoke in a gentle whisper, all alone. It's hard to hear God's voice when we're surrounded by applause. It's hard to hear God's voice when everyone is singing your praise. And God, you know, he still speaks to us the same way, primarily in the quiet place. God gave Elijah very specific instructions in an audible voice. There are several times in the Bible where this happened, where God spoke audibly, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But it's very rare. Remember, the Bible is, spans like 4,000 years from beginning to end. And even in the Bible, God didn't speak that way very often audibly. It was the exception, not the rule. Today, God primarily speaks through his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong teaches us to do what is right. God, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so the Holy Spirit uses our conscience to speak to us as we read uh, the Bible and our heart will be stirred and watch how God will often confirm his word when you're listening to biblical preaching, for example, and you'll sense that same stirring inside of your soul. God can speak through, advice, through the advice of a, a faithful friend or relative. Uh, when, when all of those things, the advice and God's word and your conscience and the Holy Spirit, when they all start to align, um, th you'll start to see God's will for your life. And this is true for big decisions that we have to make, and this is true for every single minute of our lives, of our day, where we know that we are living um, in God's purpose and in his plan. Uh, God may speak to us audibly if he chooses, but the foundation for our relationship with God is the Bible. The Bible is God's instruction manual for life. The Bible contains the thoughts that he laid down for us to read. And so it's important that we start there in our relationship with God in the quiet place. You might be blessed and highly favored. You might make the best grades. 
You might be gifted and talented. You might, be, you might climb the ladder of success. God could have you doing all kinds of things for him because you're so influential and so accomplished. But sometimes we have to be alone in the cave to hear the gentle whisper. And when your time in the cave is over, You'll not come out the way you went in. Because it's in the cave that we have to address our loneliness, our insecurities. We have to deal with our anger. We have to face our negativity. We have to learn to forgive. We don't, we don't come out the same way we went in. We come out more experienced. We come out more humble. We come out with our priorities more aligned. And we come to understand better what the Apostle John explained in 1 John 2.17, that this world, this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what God pleases will live forever. So from this cave, Elijah would, Elijah would, would go on to call Elisha, to be his successor. Elijah would mentor and prepare Elisha to be the prophet for the next generation. In fact, Elisha would have a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Uh, El Elisha is, is uh, I should say, Elijah is, the only, is only one of two people in all of human history uh, to not die. Uh, Enoch, in Genesis 5, it says that God just took him up. He was so faithful. And in 2 Kings 2, Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And God whispers in the cave, in the quiet place. Your time with God will set your course. It will help you find your purpose. You can live life with meaning and passion. You can be whole. You can find healing. Uh, we can come out of that cave stronger and better than when we first went in. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give is light. And this is why the devil would much rather have us distracted with many things, many details, uh, because the devil knows that when we're focused on Jesus, we are rising to new levels. He knows that when we are focused on Jesus, we have wisdom to make better decisions. We can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> There's a story of uh, uh, the famous baseball, baseball catcher uh, for the New York Yankees named Yogi Berra many years ago. And the, the Yankees were playing the Mil Milwaukee in the World Series championship. Next up to bat was not only one of the best hitters on the team, but one of the best hitters in all of uh, baseball history. His name was Hank Aaron. And right away, as, as Yogi did with all the batters, uh, he started chirping at Hank. And Yogi was trying to distract him with a bunch of chitter-chatter. Um, and Yogi said, uh, hey, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark, which makes no sense. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> As if that's a rule or something. You're supposed to hold it so you can read the trademark. And the, he said, the trademark is upside down. There's no way you're going to be able to read it, and there's no way you're going to be able to hit the ball. Hank Aaron didn't say anything. When the next pitch came, he hit a home run over left field fence. <laughs> Hank rounded the bases, came back to home plate, and told Yogi, I didn't come up here to read. <laughs> I came up here to hit. That's focus. That's not letting the chitter-chatter distract you. And whether you're, you hit a home run or strike out, the victory is in stepping up to the plate. The victory is in not staying in the bench. The victory is in taking some swings. In Matthew 14, Jesus sent his disciples uh, on a boat 
to the other side of the lake. Jesus stayed behind again to pray by himself up on a hill. And as the disciples were crossing the water, in the middle of the lake, a terrible storm arose. Several of the men were, of course, experienced fishermen. Uh, They were familiar with these waters, but this storm was too much to handle. Uh, they, They were not making much progress. And finally, at three in the morning, Jesus miraculously came walking on the water in the middle of the in the middle of the storm. There was thunder, there's lightning, it's so dark they can't see very well, and they certainly didn't expect someone to be walking there in the middle of the lake. So the disciples are terrified. Uh, they, they thought they were seeing a ghost. And then Jesus called out to them, like, it's okay, you know, don't be afraid. And I love, I, I, it says, it, and I'll read this, how it unfolds. This is so amazing. Um, it says in Matthew 14, 28 and on, it says, then Peter called out to him. He said, uh, Lord, if it's really you, I love that. Um, if it's really you, uh, I'm just making sure I hear your voice. I recognize your voice. And if this is right, and you're out there, he said, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. Uh, We don't know how far Peter went. Uh, You know, it could have been three steps or 30 steps. We don't know. But it really doesn't matter. Every step was an impossibility. Every step was a miracle. Uh, Peter was doing what no one had ever done besides Jesus. And as he's walking, it says in verse 30, but when he saw the storm, wind, and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Notice the moment Peter started to second guess himself, was the moment he started to sink. And don't miss that little detail there. The reason Peter started to have doubts was because he got distracted. Instead of focusing his attention on Jesus, Peter became distracted by the wind and the waves. In our walk with God, we'll always have to choose between those two things. We can focus on the wind and the waves, or we can focus on our Lord. We can focus on the storm, or we can focus on our Savior. We can focus on our problems, or we can focus on Jesus. Do we stay with what's easiest and safest, or do we climb out of the boat? We were meant for more than just avoiding failure. We were meant for more than just running from our problems. God will never lead us where his grace cannot keep us. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. And that really is the key, that the key to whatever trouble or turmoil we're facing is to keep our eyes on Jesus. And when we get distracted by the wind and the waves, which happen from time to time when we're walking by faith, because we're human, and when that happens, we'll start to sink. And you know what? That's okay. Peter didn't drown out there. We do what Peter did, and we focus back on Jesus and cry out, Lord, save me. And all it took was a simple prayer to cause Jesus to reach out and help him. And Matthew 14, 32 says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the, the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. This is the first time that Jesus is referred to as the son of God. And they bowed in worship. This is, they understand more fully now the enormity of Jesus' greatness. This is not just another man. This is God incarnate. And their faith was now more fortified than ever. But they had to meet him out in the storm. And that's how we grow in our faith, in our strength. 
if Jesus is in the water, in the storm, the victory is just obeying him to go to the other side, like he said. And if that's really him, um, his voice that we hear, then jump on out. Um, the victory is in stepping out when others stay put. The victory is in walking by faith, not cowering in fear. Some of you listening today have been sinking in sin, drowning in guilt. The wind of unrest has blown through your soul and you have no peace. Cry out to Jesus. He'll come to your rescue. That's why he came to earth. He came to set us free. He came to give us eternal life so that you can have victory over death and judgment. But you have to cry out to him for help and he will rescue you. Admit your sin. Believe that he's the only way to be saved and commit your whole life, body, mind, and soul to him and trust him as your Lord and your Savior. Let's go to God together in prayer. Father, we confess our hurry and our worry to you. Life seems to be passing by so fast. Uh, Lord, some listening today I know are in the mountain. They're in the cave, in the dark. I pray that you speak to them, Father, in the whisper. And help us all to take the time to meet with you every day for, for fresh wisdom and strength. Uh, we give you our hearts, our bodies, our minds. We surrender ourselves to you completely. Show us how to affect the next generation, to point them to Jesus. And we may not go out in a chariot of fire, but may, may it be that we are on fire for you, consumed by a desire to see your glory on earth as it is in heaven. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.